internet radio and we are so proud to be here tonight helping Sonia and Scars um, with the domestic violence push making sure that we educate and get people to understand that you know it's not right it's not fun and we need to do something about it last but not least good evening everyone Justin Q Young author best let me say that best selling author Okay. Um, graphic designer and artist, which I do paint and sip. Anybody interested in paint and sip, please hit me up after this. <laughs> Self promotion is good, bro. Always. Got, gotta do it. Gotta all do right. It. So we have a couple of questions. Some of these are, they all relate to business in some way, shape, or form because okay. this is a business networking So our first question. What kind of impact does your social media presence have on your brain? <laughs> Speaking of mine. Yes. It's a boom. Okay, sorry. Social media for my business. Social media for me, it, it levels the playing field. I'm not going to say I'm dependent on it, but I'm dependent on it. We use it all the time. It gets my message out to individuals who simply just wouldn't see it anywhere else. Uh, my full-time company, where I'm a provider of uh, mental health services uh, in the city of Richmond and slightly outside of Richmond, we have an opportunity to speak to a diverse group at any given time, 24 hours a day, and we get our message across like that. So uh, I think social media has actually pushed a lot of companies like my, like ours and many others to a place where we couldn't have had an opportunity to do it before now. Um, I would say that the impact that social media has on my brand is that um, it is very important that you are using social media in the right way to connect with those that are and are not in your field. So when you have events, to post your events and to make sure that you are posting in your events, to also connect with your fans of your pages, if they leave messages, um, if they comment on the post, to be sure that you are getting back with them and letting them know, and even if it's just liking the post, right. but to let them know that you appreciate that they are there. So just um, be sure that you are doing that. If I go and I like your post, I want you to comment or at least, you know, like it, okay? 
I'm going to be that devil, devil's advocate person. Social media can be wonderful uh, oh, yeah. for your brand, and it can also be a, a curse. Killer. Yep. Killer. <laughs> it can, it be can killer. neutralize anything positive that you do by doing one stupid thing yep. right. out on the internet because you can't take it back. It's always going to be out there. So uh, for me, as a internet radio personality and as a banker, personally, you know, I have to be very careful and cautious on how I comment on things, on how I, uh, the perception that people have, because, you know, perception is everybody's reality. We have to remember that social media is that tool that can drive people's perception of you. If they see you on social media, they don't have to technically know who you are, but they will always accompany anything that you do negative with, with, that. <laughs> with right. that. That's right. You know, so we have to be careful. Definitely got to agree with that. Um, social media, for me, I rely heavily on social media because just the business that I'm doing. I, I want to engage with my different readers, you know, with the different books that I have, as well as what I'm doing, you know, my artwork and stuff of that nature. Now, I also am a graphic designer, so I have to use social, social media. media. I have to put, you know, different um, visuals out there um, like, like I cannot say nothing negative about social media because it has been keeping me with the lights on and, and man bills and everything. So I, I love Mark Zuckerberg. You know what I mean? I'm glad that he come into Richmond and he donated a billion dollars to uh, Virginia. Um, but at the same time, just, just like what um, Brother Joe just spoke on, it can be a negative because you really have to guard the comments that you say, um, you know, religion, I try to stay away from in politics, you know, because those two things really bring about division, even if you really don't want to be divided. You know, you want to take a stand on, especially um, real, real briefly, the hashtag Me Too. Now, everybody is commenting on Me Too, and Sometimes you get the feeling that, man, this, she just want attention. Mm -hmm. That's why she using me too. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, like it's like you said, it's, it's just a gift and a curse, man. So, you know, for, for if you have a small business, you gotta utilize it because you gotta get whatever your, your product out there to the people. Nine times out of 10, we're living in a high tech, low touch world. Everybody and their mother is on mm. their phone. You can, you can be driving down the highway on any given moment, look to your left or look to your right, and you're going to see someone, 9 out of 10, looking at their cell phone. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So you have to use social media. Yeah. Thank you. Now, I'm glad that you brought up the hashtag, me too, uh, because that is, that has a lot of attention right now, and that's brought um, the issue of sexual assault all the way to the surface. And I, as I've been seeing women post their hashtag Me Too, I hear a lot of men say, wow, I had no idea it was this prevalent. I had no idea there was this much going on. So my question to you all now is, this is something I just thought of. Um, do you think that it's something that we didn't know was really going on, or is it something that we just didn't want to admit was going on? <laughs> yeah. you, you, you want that one? No, go ahead. Go okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I, you know, I'll jump out there off the ledge and I'll yeah. tell you, I think we bury our heads in the sand, folks. Yeah, go right. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Let's just be real. We bury our heads in the sand. We know that things go on and we know that things happen. But for, and I'm going to say this very politically correct, males don't understand what's going on. Men know. And we try to make a point. And I use those two very distinct differences because just because you're walking around here and you're a male doesn't mean you're a man. So, and, and some women, some women don't understand that as well. I mean, you look at domestic violence and the only thing we knew back when I was younger was men assaulting women, not just physically, but verbally. And nowadays, social media can be used to turn the tables, to turn the tables turn and tear table. people down. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, wow. 
<laughs> Go ahead and let uh, it out. I mean, tell the truth. Tell the Shame truth. the devil. Tell the truth. Uh, we're going to hashtag that. Yeah, question again. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, the table is being turned around a little bit. This, the hashtag is kind of powerful. Um, but I, I'm going to defer with you a little bit. Um, it, it does happen to a lot of guys. Oh. Yes, it does. Yes. A lot of these dudes is lying about it. Mm -hmm. They're keeping their heads down, staying off the radar. Mm -hmm. They don't want to say nothing about this mess. It ain't, it, it ain't going to happen to me. It can't happen to me. Or, you know what, if, if I keep lying about it long enough, it really didn't happen to me. So I'm not going to assimilate myself with this, this information. I'm not going to get involved in this. But the social media thing has given these people a platform to really open up, open their mouths, really give out their... You know, a lot of social media, Facebook, Twitter, it's like, it's like a diary. <laughs> But everybody can read it. So be careful what you're putting out there to go back on the first question. But yeah, um, I agree with you, brother. It's, it's there. It's there. Did you want to add? Do you want to add? Okay. He's holding on that okay. one. Okay, <laughs> so what lying. I would like to see is the men that have been molested as children, because we know that there are a lot of you who have been molested as children, who have been sexually harassed by a supervisor or a boss or a teacher, I would like to challenge you to say me too. And let us know that it has happened to you as well. We are not the only ones who are being assaulted and harassed. So let the world share your voice. We're brave enough. I'm not saying that you're not brave enough. There's this stigma with men that they feel as though if they make themselves vulnerable, that we are going to look at them in a negative light. I'm going to look at you and I'm going to applaud you because you are going to be standing up for the other young men who have gone through this. So, I'm going to challenge you, and our new hashtag is Me Too Too. <laughs> okay? So, I'm serious. If you have been, if, you, if you're brave enough, we've been putting it out there. If you're brave enough, please put it out there. You don't even have to share your story. It's just to say, hey, women, I can identify with you. Okay? That was good. Thank you. So our next question, what type of impact was someone who's being victimized or that's a victim of domestic violence have on business or have on the workplace? What's the impact on the workplace? <laughs> I'll start so I can warm yeah, them yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got to warm us up on that one because. Okay, so what a lot of people don't realize is that 25, it's about, the percentage is about 25% of time missed is due to a family issue, AKA domestic violence, okay? So if you are a business owner and you recognize that your your um, employee, be it male or female, because I do not just say that this is a female issue. So being male or female is talking on the phone to their significant other all day. Ask them, hey, what's going on? Do you need help? Ask them these questions. If you notice they're coming in with bruises, ask them, hey, what's going on? Is there any way I can help you? Do not say to them, oh, you're stupid. Why are you staying? You need to talk to this person so that they do feel safe in the home. Right. If they are at work, you've seen all of these stories, the most recent that I can remember, and I know that there's more recent than this, is the young lady in Maryland who was killed, the school teacher. You know, they were looking for her. And, um, you know, the, so the um, perpetrators, because we do not call them abusers, we call them perpetrators, they yeah. come into the uh, workplace and they will shoot up the workplace. If I'm working there and my ex-husband comes in and he shoots up the workplace and you try to save me, you can die from that. And people don't realize if I'm dealing with domestic violence um, and nobody in the workplace knows, you can die from that as an innocent bystander because you're trying to help me and you're trying to save me. We have to keep that in mind. We need to give these resources to 
our human resources department, and I do speak about this as well, domestic violence in the workplace. If you need me to come to your workplace and share this more in depth with you, I can. But we have to make this known because I do not want for any of my coworkers to be hurt. I had a young lady that I worked with and she was coming out of an abusive relationship and she shared that with me. I said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to give me a picture of this young man so we can put it up here at the receptionist desk. Nobody has to know why, but we need to know that if we see him around or if he comes into this building, we need to call the police because she did have a restraining order. So we're not saying, oh, this young man is here to see you. We have her come out there and she's assaulted. Okay? So, did I warm y'all up? Woo! All right, in my full time job, uh, the majority of the women, I, like I said, I'm a mental health service provider. We provide counseling services to uh, what people consider as at risk individuals. Many of them are children, but a lot of them are also adults. What we do, most of the women that we work with, I gotta be honest, they are either dealing with or have at some time dealt with this issue. So it's it's not that we put a special type of curve or spin on to figure out, it's part of our daily routine. Mm -hmm. uh, my counselors are always talking to their, their client base, whether it's a, a child or a, a, a young female, 14, 15 years old, who's experienced when she was you know, seven, eight years old from her dad and Uncle Ray Ray, and that's the real deal that happens. Uh, it could be a little boy who his dad and Uncle Ray Ray too. Right. We've had that happen. Yep. Um, but many of them are adults. Me, let me ask you a question. Yes. So what, so I'm, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna pose a question to him. What I, I'm sorry, what is your name? Moses. Moses, Moses. So do you have a workplace violence policy or procedure at your job? If you don't, no. you know that you well, deal with survivors of domestic violence. So I suggest that you add something in there that works with domestic violence as well. Okay. Being that we're governed by the state, mm -hmm. we, there are certain policies and procedures we have to follow mm -hmm. uh, for the workplace. They don't, they don't delve into the, uh, the concept of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not that we can't add it in. Uh, now, when dealing with our client base, there are certain things we technically, from the state's position, things we can and cannot delve into. And the, the concept of domestic violence is something that we can. So we do address that with every single client that we work with in the event that it does take place. So um, it, it's definitely something I would, I would, I would open to looking into. In my other life, and I do have an alternative lifestyle, I must acknowledge <laughs> uh, Nine to five, I, this is what I do from five until nine o'clock my other lifestyle is I'm a close range combat instructor. I basically teach people how to hurt people. Bad. Hurt people, hurt people. Yeah, uh, we, we do that. Mm -hmm. um, so I have some females in my classes and I, outside of my two sisters that I've trained, I may have two or three who have not had that story. They come into my class with the best intentions from my perspective and they're coming in, they're working out, they're training, they're, they're getting it hard, they're, they're getting it all. And then somewhere in the middle of the training, there's a flashback moment. You see their eyes flutter, and their face turns flush, and they 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 bubble their fists. And I'm like, okay, do I need to lay you out right now because you're tripping at my class? <laughs> I take her in the back, talk her in the office, and before you know it, I had a situation with my boyfriend last week, or I used to be married and I'm divorced now. But this guy, what you did is exactly what happened to me. And you have to learn how to walk and talk through these conversations. So I've had these things. And one of the conversations was actually with my, my sister. I've had the same conversation with my sister from back when she was back in California, back in the mid, mid to late 80s, in you know, high school, in college when she left to go to school. And some guy did something. And before you know it, she was an avid student in my class. But we had that conversation. So it, it's not comfortable. But you gotta deal with it, you gotta look at it from different perspectives. So I tell people all the time, my full-time job, I teach, you know, we, we, we repair people in my full-time job. In the evening, I teach people how to basically break somebody down. That's, that's kind of a double-edged sword for me. You know, it's, it's funny that we, we're, we have the discussions and we listen to what we're saying. A lot of people who have that fear of opening up, 
won't open up until there is another situation that they feel more empowered to open themselves up about. And now, uh, you know, I yeah. commend you for the fact that, you know, being able to, to, to teach those, to teach those skills, yeah. to be able to protect yourself, also opens up your mind to be able to protect your mind. To open up something else. Yeah. To open up something It's empowering. Else. It's, it's empowering. empowerment. You know, so we have to make sure, and, and I love the challenge that you gave, you know, for, for males to be able to sit there and honestly say that they've had something happen to them. Like you said, egos run a big part in our lives. You know, we don't want to be perceived as weak at all. And that is a misconception. It's not weakness if you've been hurt to ask for help. You've got to ask for it. You've got to be able to start self-healing. It's weak to not ask for it. It's weak to not. Well, you just hit the nail on the head. I'm going to go ahead and get your mic back. But no, it's, it's self-healing. What do you think? I can, I can, I can agree with um, two points. Because you had mentioned, um, you know, men speaking up and stuff of that nature. I think for a lot of times, a lot of situations, men can laugh it all for, you know, dismiss it. You know, because, you know, coming from a woman is perceived as flirt. You know, she's just being overly flirtatious or um, we in the day and age where women are aggressive. You know, so it's easy, you know, especially in like in my business, you know, I'm the only male in a room with 70, 80 women. So it's a wide range of different personalities and I'm the entertainer, I'm the host, so I gotta make sure everybody is, you know, feeling good and stuff of that nature. So I'm, I'm approaching the different ladies one on one, you know, just to make sure they enjoying themselves. So it's nothing to say, hey, hey man, go, it's hot in here, go take your shirt off. You know, it's, it's nothing and I'm gonna just laugh it off because that's the nature of the, the business that I'm in. You know what I mean? I write erotica, you know, um, I, I, I post um, different questions, thought-provoking and, and sexually uh, heightened questions on Facebook. So I know when I come to the event to, you know, to expect these type of responses because I've been posting all week. So when you get to my event and I'm wearing a tight shirt, V-neck, and I've got the cologne smell, I know it's going to cause something. So when you make your remark, it's, I'm like, yeah, I, I get which, you don't know my girlfriend is in here. So, you know, I, I easily dismiss it. Um, another thing, you know, something that I learned a while ago was this saying that hurt people hurt people. And a lot of times women have been in these abusive relationships. So when you're a good guy, and you're trying to do things the right way, a lot of times they respond only because, or they respond in a way where they try to get you to hurt them how they have been used to, the they, other guy. Or they try well. to get you first. You they've know been, what I'm saying? So I've been in a situation where well. That's what um, a young lady had tried to provoke me to get a certain response. And I can recognize it like, nah, man, <laughs> I ain't that dude. I got too much to lose, you know what I'm saying? So I definitely can um, attest to those two points that you made. As far as domestic violence in the workplace, man, this is, I feel like, unless you can see, you know, your, your coworker or your employee come in with the identifier marks on, it's hard to really, you know, pull up on and try to give or offer some kind of. There's a, there's a psychology to it. You yeah. Gotta, you gotta understand yeah. that. Yeah. You've definitely got, you can, you can recognize and see certain things. You, you, no, I don't need that mic. I, I got a big mouth. <laughs> you can recognize and see certain things, and you have to. You we we, as a management, it, it being in management, you train and look for certain things all of the time, and you're trained to be keyed in on certain things all of the time. You know, if you have a person who comes in who's happy, who's jovial, who's always that life of the party person, and they come in for several days, or you have a pattern of, you know, when you come back from the weekend, we're down or that person is down, that person is, uh, is withdrawn, that person is not, you know, putting out that. It's something you know, every human being does it. You have those feelers that you understand something isn't right. And like you said, it doesn't, it might not always be a domestic violence situation, but anything can trigger certain things. So you have to make sure that you're aware of the people that you have 
and I like to use in my care. You know, I, I'm not Big Bro Joe for no reason. I feel like I'm the big brother to everybody. You reach out and you want to make sure that everybody's okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I say that to say sometimes you need to be a little careful because people might reject that. They will, that, that, they will reject it. They will reject it. They a lot of people reject might reject that, that reach out. They'll come but back you know to, what? Come back to you later, but but don't quit. Before. Yeah, that's another thing. You can't don't quit. quit. Don't quit. Yeah. You agree? I agree. Yeah. We got more questions. Come on, y'all. I have something. He hit the mic. He got a lot. Uh, just he don't need what I've been Do you have a question? No, it's more of a comment. Okay. Just because of what I've been hearing, um, I personally know people in the male and female who have been impacted by this. So, and I have to speak on this because it's on my heart. I just heard somebody say that's weak not to speak. But I know men that have been abused. That actually, in my opinion, is just as powerful of a thing to try to overcome. So, and that stigma with that just was put out. I have, like I said, a very close friend that his ex, that's how she responded. So it was viewed that he was weak if he could not protect himself. However, he just didn't want to do anything that could potentially put him in jail because of course he was physically capable of dealing with her, but in this day and age that we live in, that is viewed as something that's just a weak man if he can't handle himself with a female. And that's kind of like, and like when you were personally touched by anything, I heard him say you don't talk about politics, but anything that touches your heart personally, and you know somebody's going through it, when you hear somebody else in essence kind of downplay what they're going through, that that's the stigma that's attached to those people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very careful with your words, just like y'all were saying earlier. So what if that person was in here that was going through that? He needs that same confidence booster just like the women do. So I just think that needs to be said as we're going through that. So that was on my heart, because like I said, I know people that are men that are going through it, not that they can't take care of themselves, but once again, you don't want to be labeled as someone that did something to a woman, even though she did something to you. So you're, that's a very tough situation to be in just as well. I just wanted to say that. Thank you for that. Thank you, and to piggyback, yes, get on hand, please. So just to piggyback a little bit off of what you just said, thank you for that comment. Um, as, as I said when we opened up, and Tiana piggybacked off of me, that it is not just a women's issue. No. Men are abused each and every single day. And like you said, I'm glad you said stigma, because there is a stigma that's attached to it. And a lot of times we laugh, when we hear, man, she went upside my hair last night, and we laugh, but it's not funny because it's abusive, but we don't equate the two. We don't call it what it is. We don't call a woman calling a man out of his name and calling him everything but the, the name that his mother gave him abuse, but that's what it is. Verbal abuse, emotional abuse, mental abuse. It's still abuse. So yes, there are many broken men that are walking around, and some of you are right here in this room. Many, many broken men walking around, not healed, because of things that have happened in the past. Whether there's somebody today that's going to go home to it. Yes. That's the reality of <laughs> yep. it. Male or female. I'm not politically correct. So male or female, that's somebody, when they go home tonight, you don't know what you're going to go home to. You don't know what that's gonna look like when you walk through the door. And that's the reality of it for so many people. So that's why we're having this discussion, okay? Because it's real. There's a question in the back. Who has a Oh, let me go to the back. Okay. Who is it? Somebody raise your hand. What's the score the game? There's a question in the back. A question in the back. I got I got pride on this Somebody game here right now. A statement? <laughs> okay, come up to me. We were, we were up for nothing a little while ago. Good evening, how is everyone doing? Hello. Good evening, how are you? Uh, I know this was a forum set up for particular speakers and whatnot, but this is what I'd like to say. I know you all talked about abuse and whatnot. What I want to touch on is about kids. Uh, a lot of us have kids, and when they meet their uncles, they meet their grandmothers, whoever, we say, give your uncle a hug. Mm -hmm. Give your uncle a kiss. 
And a lot of times, our kids don't want to do that. But a lot of us, what do we do? Force. We make them do that. So I'm telling everyone in here, and I'm gonna keep it short and sweet about this because I love kids, kids are my heart. Uh, I have a children's book published. And uh, I got another one that's on the way. But I say that because I'm telling all of you all, do not ever make your kids hug or kiss anyone. Anyone, and I'm real serious about that. Do not make your kids hug or kiss anyone. Because if they feel something, they know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. Don't make them do that. That's not saying that, that person is bad. But if they don't want to do it, don't make them. Because if you make them do it, then in their mind, sooner or later, they're going to think that they're supposed to. Even if it's someone that they don't like. Or I'm supposed to hug them. I'm supposed to kiss them. So this could build on something yeah. later on in yeah. life. Yeah. That yeah. could lead to the type of things that you all are talking about. Yep. So that was all I wanted to say. Thank you so much. Good point. Good point. Very good point. Very good point. Thank you so much, Scott, for that comment. And he is exactly right. Question in the back. A question in the back. How y'all doing? Um, my question is, a lot of times you see friends and family who are in abusive relationships and don't necessarily know how to get out and you tend to constantly say, make a plan, make a plan, make a plan. But sometimes crazy is just plain crazy. And a lot of times people are scared to leave because of the impact it will have on their family. Because if we, as we've seen in the world, there are a lot of people out there doing terrible things. And in order to, you know, like Justin said, hurt people, hurt people, in order to really get to that person, they will hurt people around and make the person feel like they were, they caused it because they didn't stay with the person. So. How do you, when you recognize, like I said, I agree with you when you say you don't tell people they're stupid or dumb, or why did you stay? Because a lot of times people just stay because they have no choice. They, they could be making more money than their perpetrator. You know, they, it's, it, it's not about money. It could just simply be about what they have seen in that house, in that private place, and they know that that person has the potential to do harm to others, and more like that person has no fear. So. You know, I, I just think about I think about it all the time with that young lady, the Baltimore Ravens. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, when I'm looking at her, I can see with her head down, like Brother Joe was saying, her head down, her submissive attitude. That won't be the first time that she's been hit, but maybe she just don't know how to lead because she has seen crazy up close. So how do you tell your friends and family? How do you support them and also keep yourself safe? How do you support them? And, and helping them get out or helping them find a safe place when they know more than you do about how crazy this person is. Even though you keep trying to say, all you got to do, all you got to they telling you no, know, it's bigger than that. How do you help your friend? So I'm gonna share something real quick. And then I'm gonna answer your question. So I stayed with my abuser for 11 years because I knew he was crazy. I never told anyone. I wish I would have had someone that would have asked or that would have said, girl, something ain't right with you. Why? What are you talking about? But I hid it very well. My abuser was certified. Two years ago, he ended up killing not only his one-year-old child, but his mother, I mean her mother, and then killed himself and two other people in a car accident. What? I didn't know at the time, I knew in my heart that he was capable. Holy shit, because he had shot at me, I had guns put in my face, he told me many, many times that he was killed. The one question that I pose to someone that's being victimized 
is I give you two options. Do you want to live or do you want to die? And sometimes you have to break it down really to that simplest form. Do you want to live or do you want to die? Because if you stay, you can die. And it really is that serious. It's not a joking matter. And sometimes people say, well, I need to stay because of the kids. I need to stay because my children need their father and they need to see their family together. But I say, don't stay for the kids, leave for the kids. Mm -hmm. So if you do have someone in your life that is being victimized, yes, safety planning is something to be there as a support to that person. Help show them what it really is to safety plan. That girl, pack a bag, or pack a bag, have it at my house. So that when they, when that phone call comes, when that knock on the door comes, they don't have to worry about how am I gonna do this? I, I need to get the clothes, I need to get the kids, their shop records and their birth certificates, all of this is already done. Yep. Help them on that level. You might even want to give them a code word. So if they call you at 2 o'clock in the morning and they give that word, you know what you need to do. Call police, bring into action, do whatever it is that you need to do. But the one thing that someone that is being victimized needs is a support system. Because the only thing that they know is, or the one thing that they think is, I'm alone and it's just me. And nobody understands what it is that I'm going through. So support. Um, safety plan with them, but safety plan on a whole other level, not just say safety plan, but show them what that really means. Gather resources for them. Um, if, if it's you, if you can allow them to stay with you, let them know that you can stay with me. You can come stay here. If that's not safe, find somewhere for them to go. That might mean sending them out of the state. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. But you have to do whatever it is that you need to do to keep them safe. Because they know how crazy that person is. Because like you said, they live it each and every single day. So they know what that person is capable of. And if that means that they need to leave, then they need to leave because it is a matter of life or death. And you might just have to pose it just that way. Yep. Do you want to live or do you want to die? Yeah. Um, so, okay. I just wanted to say one thing. That mm -hmm. Everyone doesn't have to be a victim to want to know about domestic violence. Right? You can be a victim and not have to be a off of Sonia and just to just add a little bit more. When I left my ex-husband, I literally left with the clothes on my back. Nothing. And a change of clothing for my children. My son was three at the time and my daughter was five. My son is now 19, believe it or not, and my daughter is 21. Okay? So, when, when I left him, I left with nothing because I knew that I had to save my kids. So what Sonia is saying is, do you want to live? What I'm saying that you post to them if they have children is, how do you want your children to be treated as adults? I read a statistic when I was in a battered women's shelter that said that 63, listen to this y'all, 63% of juvenile males that are in jail for murder or homicide are there for killing their mother's abuser. I have a son. My son was angry as a three-year-old. Had I stayed in that relationship and my son had become one of the 63%, that was my fault because I had the power to leave. Let alone the statistic for girls 
being becoming victims themselves because I have a son and a daughter talk to them about their children if they have to leave tell them you gotta go you cannot stay here in this state you need to leave I left from Pennsylvania and I went to Washington DC and now I'm here in Virginia I have no family except for Sonia I have no family down here and, and they need but my my friends that I have built this family with that are in Virginia, you can start over. I got, that was in 2001. You can start over. You do not have to stay there. If you cannot do it for yourself, do it for your children. Tell them, do it for your children. Do it, just keep telling them that. Do it for your kids. Don't let your kids be beat. Don't let your kids turn into abusers. Do it for your kids, okay? And everything else Sonia said about um, safety planning and all of that, and like Danique said, if y'all need help, that's what SCARS does. We are aftercare, but we can point you into the direction of those that can help you with the resources so you can help your family and friends. We need this to stop. military um, and being in military it's a lot of it's regiment yeah. um, it's so you know and I felt like I was in the military myself um, mm -hmm. when she was talking um, when when someone comes to you at the workplace um, and they become transparent with you at that moment and they're opening up to you you may be the only voice in the advocate or avenue to help that person that may be a vehicle for you to partner with that person just to encourage them, let them know that they're gonna be safe. Because for me, in my situation, because my ex-husband was military, yeah, my family felt right? like that was golden. Yep. They felt like he had a for sure job. He wasn't gonna just get fired tomorrow. He was an officer in the military. So they felt like I was set up for success in that area. But sometimes your family may not be the best people to encourage That's you at right. that time right. and yep. you may need someone to encourage you have a friend a co-worker for me i had someone at my job that i just spoke to and pretty much said this is what i'm going through every time i was being beat on a regular basis all i was trying to do was cover my face so that i wouldn't have the scars when i went to a workplace um, so nobody would be able to see it you know um and then like she stated as well, we have our children. I have two boys, 28 and 19. If I would have stayed, my 28-year-old, I had to place him into counseling because he was so angry at the fact that he was watching the abuse happen over and over and over. Be careful of the people that you put in your kid's life to make sure that those people are someone that is upstanding, and that you're gonna respect and make sure that they're gonna be a role model for your children, especially if they're men. I'm a woman, I can't teach my boys how to be men. All I can do is encourage them and plant a foundation and hope that they would do the right thing in that aspect. So if someone is coming to you and asking or even sharing their journey with domestic violence or what they're going through, let, the, let just know that, that that is them being transparent and that may be a cry for that person saying, I need help. They may not come out and say it. For me, my self-esteem was to the ground. I, I, he said I wasn't gonna be nothing. You, you aren't nothing. It didn't matter, I was college educated. You know, I was working a full-time job. But once you continue to hear that and it's imparted into your mindset on a continuous basis, you start to think that. You don't start to say that I'm better than this or encourage yourself to know that you can do better. So if that person is coming to you, I would just say, just be a listening ear and encourage them. You don't have to know everything about that person, just like you. I, I, I'm 18 hours away from all my family. I had nobody. So to me, that was a helpful source for somebody to be able to encourage and help me to be able to get out. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, my name is Marcy Williams, and I'm the director of a youth workforce program here for this region. And so I work with a lot of youth ages 17 to 24. But one of the things I encourage everyone here is pay attention to the teens. Yes. I deal with a lot of youth that come into my centers that are being victimized. Mm -hmm. They're with their baby daddy, their baby, their boo. They can't leave. They just had a baby. Um, they're in the car. He hitting her, she hitting him. And it starts early in high school. I see with my middle schoolers that are being abused. So pay attention. It's not kids being kids. It's not they're going through puberty. They're going to grow out of it. He's going to stop. He's just jealous. She's just insecure. Pay attention to the signs. We have to correct this early. I deal with a lot of youth that come that have been beaten that have been hurt, that I have to call the, the police, I have to send them to the hospital because they don't know where to go. I encourage you, parents, pay attention. Listen, if they're on social media, and they're crying, they're screaming, they're on the phone, listen, it's not just being teens. You need to correct it now before it gets too late. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, thank you. to share your thoughts with us. Can we give our panelists a hand? So, I guess I should, really quick, well, we're going to do raffle. I'm going to give the prize to the person that won the Who Am I contest first. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, um, just to tell you a little bit about SCARS. SCARS is an aftercare service provider for survivors of intimate part partner and domestic violence. And so we're located here in Richmond. Um, we do educate and bring awareness to domestic violence. We're also an adv advocacy group. Um, we are currently fundraising to be able to get a building to provide workforce development services and eventually transitional housing for survivors. So that is our mission. Uh, we do have our fifth annual event coming up on this Saturday, which is called Purple Pillow Talk. I'll be giving away a pair of tickets also for Purple Pillow Talk. And it will be located at the Touch of Class event hall um, in Northside. And that's from 6 to 9 on this Saturday. So I'll be giving away a pair of tickets as well. If you want to know any more about it, please come and see me. Thank you. 